Uh, do, you, do you remember really visiting someone or, or even when someone comes to visit you, our natural inclination is that we want to show them around. We want to introduce them to people. We want them to eat at the places that impacted us. We wanted to essentially guide them in this new area or this new community. Or, or even more, if you've ever visited another country, it's helpful to have a tour guide who knows where everything is. Uh, at least for me, if I have this sense of being lost or not knowing where I am, the anxiety begins to build up. But if you have someone, and I've experienced this, not even having a tour guide in another country, but if you're with someone who knows where they are, even though I don't, it brings that anxiety down. And so it's good to have someone to kind of show you the things you may, you may not see, you may overlook, you might miss. Uh, but it also allows that anxiety to kind of melt away. Now, over the last three weeks, we've been in our series, The High Impact Church, and we've been looking at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, through the first part of verse 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now, what we've been covering in this text is how Christ has commanded us all to go and proclaim the gospel, lead the lost to Christ, and then disciple them to follow Christ. But what's come up among the staff is, okay, well, how can this be practically applied? We've seen clearly that we are all to go and tell people about Jesus, but how? Is there scripture that I can use? Is there scripture I can use to point them or let's say, um, as, as we go through our Wednesday nights, uh, one of the things we're going to be doing, actually, is we're going to be far more practical Wednesday nights at our Wednesday Night Live to be able to get into this in far more depth. Um, at some point during this year, we're going we're gonna to go through how to prepare your testimony. We're going to go through how to, pr- how to talk to someone cold about Jesus, how to in- inject the gospel into conversations. These are things we want to help equip you to be able to accomplish. But if that's something you haven't been trained in or, or shaped with, then you, you get anxious. You don't know what to do in that journey. Well, when the conversation is kind of being presented to be able to minister to someone and you've never really been led in that or taught in that, that anxiety builds up and a lot of times we'll just let that opportunity pass because the anxiety is so crippling. But what if, as we get into next week, what if you're faced with this conundrum of, well, I know that I need to be discipled and I need to disciple others, but, but what if I'm at a point in my life where I need to be discipled more than I am discipling? Well, that's, there's no shame in that, but what does that look like? So over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at these. And today, we're going to be focusing on evangelism and conversion. Uh, but before we get into that guided tour, I do want to address something. Self-doubt is crippling the church. We've been yielding to doubt more than God the Holy Spirit. And so followers, followers of Christ, God has called us by name. He has adopted us as sons and daughters, enlisted us into his army to go and impact the world. And not only that, he has empowered us. He has equipped us to go and accomplish this. And so as we get into our responsibility of evangelizing and disciple, I need you to understand where I'm coming from. First, I need you to understand that I'm well aware that this body, this family is not made up of hyper extroverted, evangelistically gifted Apostle Paul incarnate. I understand that within this group, there are going to be people who are introverted, people who struggle with cold interactions, people who conversations don't come easy at all. And in that, I want you to understand that I recognize that what we're covering is going to be of deep challenge to you. And so I want you to hear me on this. I'm not shaming you at any point. I know that for some of you, this is going to be very difficult to put into motion. And you have all my my respect in the world for walking out this obedience. But I cannot be your pastor if I will not challenge you or spur you to walk in obedience to Christ. We are all called to do this. But I want you to resist the temptation to compare your steps to another person. For example, if say talking to someone about Christ 
That one step has required of you to, to fulfill, let's say, a total of three hours of prayer. You had six hours of contemplation and meditation, and it produced one interaction. That's awesome. That's huge. That's an atta boy. That's an atta girl. There's nothing to be ashamed of. But what happens is, is we compare ourselves to, to people who are different from us, and that, for example, you might compare yourself to a hyper extrovert and you look at their steps and you think they're so far ahead of me. I just took one step and they're on step 20. But here's what we really miss in the process. For those of us like myself who people are like caffeine and you're so extroverted in that way, you lean on that so much that you don't lean on Christ the way you should. So for example, I might be on step 20 before I get to what you accomplished in your one step. You see, God flips everything upside down. He says, if you want to lead, you have to serve. If you want to be first, you have to be last. And if we just compare the steps, you think that person must be so much godlier, so much further. But the truth of the matter is, is when they were at step 19, you were actually leading them in your one step. You modeled prayer. You modeled being in the word. You modeled and you lived it out in a way that led someone that you perceived to be further along. Because us extroverts, we lean on that so much. We don't lean on Christ enough. But for your one step, you leaned on him every single inch. And that is awesome. And so understand, we're, we're not saying any of this to shame or to guilt or any. We're asking you simply to press in. In fact, when you look at another believer, may their walk encourage you, but never discourage you. I understand there are men and women in the faith that are encouraging, that you see how they're living out their faith. But may that be an encouragement to you, not discouragement. The steps that you take in Christ, I don't care how long it takes you to take that step, only that you are pressing to take it. And so we're all commanded to go and make disciples. And for some of us, that's going to be a little bit easier to do to engage people. And for others, it's going to take time. Both people, both groups have honored God. Both have obeyed God. Both have, are obedient followers of Christ. And so understand there's no shame to be had. If you need to be convicted or you need a kick, that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's not coming from me. Go and make disciples. Now, if you recall... We discussed that in order for someone to be a disciple of Christ, they must first be saved. And so what I want to do is I want to go through Scripture to help equip you. I don't want you to feel bombarded. All the Scripture we're covering is in your sermon notes. I simply want you to have them as a resource to be able to go back and study, to take in, so that you will be able to communicate the truth that is there. And so it might seem like there's a lot of Scripture. Don't panic. Don't be bombarded. It's all there. First, we have to address the, the subject of sin. The Bible says in Romans 3, first part of verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Have some, have most, have, no, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who is righteous. There is no one who measures up to God's holy and righteous perfection. None. Zero. Nada. None of us. 1 John 1.8 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So not only have we fallen short, we have no recourse to be able to say that we haven't. We if anyone says they have no sin or they do not sin, you can immediately know, well, they're a liar. The Bible's very clear, and the world's very clear. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, one of the ways that we might be able to communicate this in, I think, a highly relatable way is, is through one of the tragedies of the fall of mankind, and that is how disease flooded into a broken world. And I think that we can all relate to one illness in particular, and that is cancer. And we can use this as a two, for a twofold purpose. First, there's an emotional connection to cancer. Someone we love have dealt with it. 
And as a result, there's a hatred for cancer because of the love that we have for another person. And second, there's an innate desire for the illness to be cured. And so I would encourage you to make those connections. Sin is like cancer. It's infected our very souls and it's infected evident parts of our lives. For example, we see its effect on the eyes. Lust is rampant in our world. We see the effects of sin on the brain. We reject, we deny, we change what we know to be true for something that is false, whether that's for comfort, cowardice, cultural pressure, or social pressure. We see the effects on things such as our kidneys, where we actually live our lives and we don't regulate what is good and healthy. We no longer produce the same moral fiber that we once did, and instead we allow more and more toxicity into our lives. Sin is like cancer, and its effects are evident. But what is also true is this. Someone who is otherwise healthy, they're fit, they're sharp, but there's cancer somewhere in their body, they are deemed sick. The same is true for sin. In anywhere, in any part of our lives, James 2.10, forever keeps the whole law, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. There's no such thing as a big or little sin. There's no such thing as a venial or mortal sin. There's all mortal sin. It is all the most high treason against a holy and righteous God. And we've all done it. We've all fallen short. And when you speak to someone about sin, don't be afraid to speak of your own. And this is where it gets difficult because we grew up in a culture, some of us, especially if we grew up in church, where you kept all that to yourself. Whether it's some self-righteousness of not wanting to burden another believer in what you're struggling with, which makes no sense at all according to Scripture. Or whether it's just you were raised in a culture that you were supposed to wear this mask when you came to church. That's why, that's why a couple sermons ago I pushed against that and said the Christian you are at home is the Christian we should see here. That's the real you, so bring the real you here. Don't bring a facade, don't bring a fake. We can do nothing with a fake person here. And the kingdom of God has nothing to do with fake people. This faith is to be lived out authentically and passionately through those who truly follow Christ. And so when we come and, and, and involved and engage with somebody and we're speaking of sin, don't be afraid to talk about your own. Because what separates us, because we fall short, we still fall short. We, in fact, we did nothing to earn God's love and salvation. But what separates us from them is the receiving of that free gift. Don't be afraid to share your own fall, your own struggles. In fact, going back, if, if we look at the day of Pentecost, they ask this question, what must we do to be saved? A very important question. And I have no doubt that those who asked it, they asked it correctly because Scripture tells us that they were added to the kingdom that day. But our culture, when they read that statement, what must I do to be saved, our culture interprets it this way. I need to perform. I need to do. I need to accomplish. And then I get that. See, they see salvation as something that is earned. They see it as a wage. Well, the Bible does speak of our wages. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin, which we've all done, is death. What we're trying to communicate with people is this, but... But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we must keep in mind that as we talk to people about sin, as we may speak of specific sin in their own lives, we got to understand we have our own sin, and that sin earned the same exact thing, death. So don't act like your sin don't stink. Be humble. We did nothing to gain the love of our Savior. We did nothing to merit His death. We did nothing to earn our adoption. We, what changed our standing with God was His spilled blood, His finished work, His righteousness that now covers us. That's what changed for us. And sin has made us sick. But Christ is the cure. When we look at salvation in the Christian church, we emphasize Peter's interaction with the crowd at Pentecost. We just spoke about this a little bit. 
And I'm not playing devil's advocate. I really want us to walk through this because when someone is willing to accept that they are a sinner, which I found in this culture is the hardest part to accept, this is the next part of their conversion. In Acts 2.38, they asked, what must we do to be saved? And, And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we emphasize this because it communicates the entirety of one's conversion. However, here's what I want us to be careful of, making this verse a checklist. Repent, be baptized, then I get. And I want us to walk through this. In Acts 16, if you remember, uh, God's breaking Paul out of jail. The jailer looks and sees that all the, all the cells are opened and he's about to kill himself. And Paul calls out, no, we're still here. And Paul evangelizes to him. And in Acts 16, this is the interaction they have. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, and listen to this, what must I do to be saved? It's the same question. And this is what Paul said in response. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. He's presented with the same question and he says, believe in the Lord and you will be saved. There's no mention of baptism. Did Paul contradict Peter? Well, no. If we look in verse 33, and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he baptized them at once, he and all his family. But also in Acts 16, there's no mention of the Holy Spirit indwelling anyone. Does that mean that these new converts are not marked with their salvation? Well, of course they're indwelled. Of course they're saved. For one, Paul the Apostle's there, and if it didn't happen, he would have said something. Moving forward, we look in Acts 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few more days. Here in Acts 10, we have essentially Pentecost for the Gentiles. These men were eager to hear what God was to say and what he was to say through Peter. And what we see is we don't see any formal proclamation of belief or repentance. But this had to happen. We may not see it in the text, but it clearly had to happen in order for God the Holy Spirit to indwell them and impart gifts. We see they were indwelled by God the Holy Spirit, and then Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And in Acts 22, when Paul recounts his conversion on the road to Damascus, if you remember, Jesus appears to him and strikes him blind until Ananias came and prayed for him. And this is Paul retelling his interaction with Ananias. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Paul, or Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness of him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now it seems that Ananias left out belief and repentance. Just go into the water, is that it? Now the reason why I fell in love with the Christian church is its devotion to Scripture and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture I grew up in a wave of Christendom that made everything allegory. Giant, the giant of David was a problem in my life. The tree in the garden was a tree in my life. And we allegorized it. I get the attempt. We want scripture to come alive, but when we allegorize something like that, we remove the meat of the teaching and and we start to create a generation of people who look, at, look in the Bible and look for themselves rather than look in the Bible and see Jesus. That becomes a long-term issue. 
This faith is alive. God is active. This, this word is the living word. It, is, it is, is across every culture of this continent, and people are being converted. They're being transformed, not conformed. How is it that this book can go anywhere in the world and bring people to know God without then forcibly drawing them to be something completely different as you see with Islam? When Islam enters a culture, what happens to that culture? It's destroyed. Plain and simple. But when Christianity is taken into a culture, you see the culture come alive and thrive You see now their drums being banged instead of false gods. Their drums are being banged for the one true living God. It's incredible. This is alive and active. And when we look at Scripture, we must allow Scripture to interpret itself. And so as a church, we cleave to Acts 2.38. But I caution you to not make this a salvation checklist. Because the truth of the matter is that water is not magical. If it were just about the water, then I would encourage you, bring every unbeliever you know to church next week, we're dunking them. If that's all that mattered, I will wrap them up in a bear hug. They cannot say no. They're going in the water. If the water were all that mattered, then we should just throw people in. But when they believe, they call upon the name of Christ as God. When they repent, they recant their previous life in the way that they were living and surrender to God, now that water becomes a grave of resurrection. Now baptism holds power and meaning. It holds power because God has taken from them their heart of stone, prophesied from the prophet Ezekiel. Now that water holds power because God's regeneration of a sinner's heart. We see all through the book of Acts, God convicting men and women of their sin, His Spirit indwelling, believers being baptized into Christ. And when we cleave word for word to one verse, it it removes the rest of Scripture. You see, in Acts chapter 2, Peter tells them how to become followers of Christ. In Acts 16, Paul tells the jailer how to become a follower of Christ. In Acts 16, Paul, or in Acts Acts 16, Paul recounts the, the story of when Ananias told him how to become a follower of Christ. None of them contradict themselves. But it's because of what Christ is doing in the hearts of men to draw them to repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. If sinners will not believe and repent, then there is no hope of salvation. If there's no belief or repentance, then we haven't even gotten out of the starting blocks. But what I love about the Christian church is this. We do what we are commanded to follow Christ, and we do it in rapid succession. Boom, boom, boom. Believe, repent, be baptized. In fact, that's what we see in Scripture at this very hour. Peter ordered. We don't put it off. It all happens simultaneously. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. There's water. Let's do it. That's how we roll in the Christian church. We don't put it off. Scripture's commanded it, so we do it. We're not going to wait. Let's knock this out. Let's be obedient now. Let's not be obedient in a couple weeks. That's what I fell in love with. And I would encourage you, in Romans 10, read that chapter. It's an excellent chapter on belief and repentance. Read Romans 6. We'll read a, the, a large portion of it today. Excellent chapter on baptism. And what we see in all this is God does all the heavy lifting. God will convict. God will draw people unto himself. God will indwell. We are called to be obedient. Tell them of the one that they should call upon. Tell them of the one that they are to repent and follow. Tell them of the one that they are to be baptized into. God will work, God will move, God will indwell. Let him be God. You be a servant of God and tell people what he has done. And so we summarize the Christian conversion in this way. Believe, repent, be baptized. Believe. Show them that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Show them he is who the apostles claimed him to be. See, every apostle apart from John, but not for lack of effort, all suffered and died being his disciple. And they died being tortured 
and poor, what did they have to gain? What did they gain from all this apart from a lot of nuisance, a lot of pain, and a lot of suffering? But even more, the Bible is the most heavily attested historical document in the ancient world, and nothing comes close. That's like me still racing Usain Bolt in the 100 meter when he broke the world record. I'm still running. It's not even close. No other historical document comes close. So we have nothing to hide or be fearful of when these questions arise. In fact, the reason why we need to understand this and the reason why we need to be more engaged in apologetics is because these are the peripheral questions that we need to answer and get out of the way so they can really be asked the real question, and that is, is Jesus who he claimed to be? And if so, that changes everything. They might have questions about the historicity of the Gospel of John. They might have questions about this, about that. Answer those the best you possibly can. Study. And don't jump into an answer without knowing it. It, There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, let me study that a little more and let me get back to you. Nothing wrong with that. That shows a lot of humility. But we address those to get rid of the fog so they can see the real question, is Jesus who he claimed to be? That's what we want them to face. That question. Repent. In the Greek, this word means to turn away. Repentance is the turning away from one's previous life to now follow Christ. It is the process by which we recant our previous God, which is ourselves, our sin, our addiction, and we turn declaring Christ alone as our God. We can then understand how Jesus' death on the cross can be given to us. Jesus, holy perfect and righteous God died a sinner's death. Now we who are unholy, imperfect sinners can be given, be wrapped in, clothed in the righteousness of Christ because he clothed himself in our sin on the cross. The theological term with this is called substitutionary atonement. That's in your notes. Feel free to go and study that topic. Listen to lectures. Dig into that more. Because he wrapped himself in our sin, he can now wrap us in his righteousness. Because he bore our sin on the cross, he can now give us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Lastly, be baptized. See, now the water becomes a grave. When we believe, when we repent, now we see this event of baptism being powerful in the conversion of a believer. Turn to Romans chapter 6 for me. Romans chapter 6. You're going to have to bear with me. You know I can't read. Hooked on pahonics didn't work for me, but we're going to get through it. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. You know where we're going to be? I'm going to go ahead and jump right on in. So Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus uh, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one, who has di- for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never again die. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. 
Our world thinks that the Bible, the church, the Christian faith is no longer relevant to today. And it's our responsibility who have had their lives radically changed to not only show them, but tell them in all love, you're wrong. You're wrong about what you think about Scripture. You're wrong about what you think about Jesus. You're wrong about what you think about the church. You're wrong about these things, these perceptions. And I understand that some of these perceptions came about by real life events. I've been burned by the church too. Has anyone had a family member hurt them? If we're going to be a family, there's going to be some messed up people in it. But we are to minister to them. Love them, care for them. I, I, I tell people that the, the best and worst part about the Christian faith is that it opens the door to narcissists and, and selfish and arrogant people. But the good news is it opens the door to narcissists, selfish, arrogant people. But as Casting Crowns, they had a song that says, God's got to change your heart before he changes your shirt. God's got to change people's heart before he starts addressing deep-rooted narcissism, deep-rooted arrogance, pride, selfishness, gossip. It's our job to get them to Christ and bring them to him as much as possible that he will get to work and completely and radically transform their life. But I understand. I've been hurt by the church too. I've been hurt by the church while serving in the church. But like one pastor said, they didn't abandon Jesus because of Judas. I understand. Hurt happens. And I'm not negating it. And I'm not saying that what you went through wasn't genuine. But you can't abandon the bride because of what some people have done. Because the Lord is returning, and who's he returning for? He's not returning for an individual who sits in their home, lives out their faith alone. He's returning for his bride. It's important that we recognize that this body is not just a group of people who come together, who agree on what the Bible says, and you get kicked around by the preacher every now and then. You go home and say, thank you, may I have another? And then that's the end of it. This is a family. This is to be people who are, are invested in each other's lives, who care about each other's marriages, who care about the relationships that we have, who care about the, the, those who are lost in our family. Because if, you're, if your mom doesn't know Jesus, and as far as I'm concerned, my mom doesn't know Jesus. That's how this works. We bear up under one another. We love one another enough to go, you know what? I'm willing to have my life burdened by your struggles because I love you. Because we are a family. Because we are a body. And our world thinks that that's not relevant anymore. How wrong they are. It is our responsibility to show them in all love the truth of who Jesus is. His salvation. How they can meet him how they can be buried with him and raised a new creation. It is our responsibility to take that message to them so that they would see he is alive. What an incredibly humble and exciting mission we are on. Because God has called each and every one of us. You can look in the mirror and see all the reasons why you shouldn't, why you couldn't, why you're inept, and God says, I can work with that. That's encouraging. that he's picking us to get in the game. Praise God that he would use weary and broken sinners like us to perform the works that are needed to have his kingdom march on. Praise God that he would use broken sinners like us to redeem us, that he would show the world, I am the God of love and redemption and I will radically transform your life. So therefore, go. Go. Look at these scriptures on your own. Go through them as you examine them. Wrestle with them. If you need someone to discuss this with, uh, discuss it with the person who's discipling you. Or, or you can come to me, email me. I'd be more than happy to go more in depth with those. But wrestle with them so that you would be able to communicate them. You can communicate scripture with people without quoting Romans 3.23. You just quote it. <laughs> you don't have to cite it. You say, you know, everyone's messed up, right? It's pretty obvious. We're... 
And you know there's a moral standard, and you know we fall short of that standard. I think there's a gentleman, um, he does this a lot, uh, Ray Comfort. He goes through the Ten Commandments, and he'll cold call people. Uh, and it's a, very, it's a very loving way of, of his ministry to be able to tell people, look, I've fallen short. Find your own way of talking to people about this. And I tell you that because you're, finding your own way is what makes you unique to the kingdom of God, and that is essential. First Christian Church, we are therefore to go. Go and convert the lost. Go and evangelize to the lost that they would know the one true living God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that you would use us in such a way that we would have a role in your kingdom. I know that each and every one of us has our own foibles, our own mistakes. The sins of our past still uh, haunt us in some ways. Help us, Father, to release those and let those go. That we would remember them as we tell people of where you've brought us, but that we would not remember them for the sake of them dragging us down again and again when you've already paid in full the punishment of that sin. So we would stop punishing ourselves. Father, work in us. Give us a boldness to go and minister to the lost, that we would step up in those times where your Spirit calls us to speak. Help us, Lord, to cast away that anxiety. May your word come to the forefront of our minds. May we be able to minister in that moment, share the wonderful gospel that is your son's death on the cross, that we would know you, that we would be adopted as sons and daughters. And in a world filled with fatherlessness, to be able to tell people there's a father who will love you perfectly, that's an incredible message. I pray, Lord, that as we go from here, you would fill us with boldness, cast away our anxiety, and that we would fulfill the call you've given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.